Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is uh, Dr. Indu Subramanian. I am a neurologist at uh, UCLA and I'm also the director of the PADRIC, uh, Southwest PADRIC, um, here at the West Los Angeles VA. Today I'm joined by Professor Michael Oaken. He is um, the executive director of the Fixel Institute um, at, of Neurologic Diseases at the University of Florida. We have a blog together called Parkinson's Secrets, and he wrote a beautiful blog um, about uh, something that was a very hot topic around biomarkers in Parkinson's disease that had been um, hyped through the media, lots of um, attention through a lot of our support groups. And I think people have just been trying to understand a little bit about what is this biomarker breakthrough. So he wrote a blog called Quaking Our Way to a Parkinson's uh, Biomarker Breakthrough in 2023. Welcome, Mike. It's great to be with you and uh, and fantastic to, to try to talk through this really, uh, really cool and interesting subject. So there was a paper that came out that led to this sort of hype. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the paper and its findings. It actually traces back to a paper that was just published in a journal called Lancet Neurology. And it was led by an author named Andy Sidoroff, who's a professor of neurology and, and leads the Parkinson movement division at the University of, of Pennsylvania. And what Andy and his colleagues did is they looked into the Michael J. Fox Foundation's, you know, their treasure trove. They have this awesome study called the PPMI. They had about a thousand patients. They had collected the spinal fluid. That's a fluid that bathes the brain. And they had um, all these clinical scores and smell scores. And, and, uh, and what they did is they took that spinal fluid and they took all of the information, including the genetic status of the folks that were in that study, and they performed a test called real-time quaking. Some people call it an assay, okay, a synuclein seeding assay, where they were able to see whether or not this abnormal protein in Parkinson's synuclein, they could show it in, that, in those spinal fluid samples and then correlate it to the different uh, disease within these thousand really super well-characterized folks that were collected by the Michael J. Fox Foundation. And so Ken Merrick and Andy Sidoroff, and then there was a, a guy named Claudio Soto, who was really instrumental in developing this technology and, and this assay over many years, put this together. And, and it was, it was, it was a, you know, a, a big wake up call for the field about what could be done with this type of technology. Very cool technology indeed. So why do they call it RT quick? First of all, it's not quick. So that's the first thing that that folks should know. It's it's actually real-time quaking. And and what it is essentially is you've got to figure out how to measure that bad Parkinson protein, you know, within that spinal fluid. And so what they did is they actually used a technique that was invented not for Parkinson, but for what's called prion disease or kritzfeld jakob disease, which is sort of a rapidly progressing dementia, cognitive dysfunction syndrome. That's not super important. What is important is that they were able to take protein in that disease and quake it. Quake it meaning they, shake, they shook it and they shake it for hours and hours and hours, sometimes 20 hours or more. And they try to separate out the bad protein from the good protein, and they actually will add some what's called recombinant good protein, and the bad protein will bind with that, and then they can measure it when it crystallizes, and it changes its configuration of how it folds. It's very cool, and then it can tell you, in, in the old days, when it was used just for prion disease or kritzfeld jakob it told you whether you had this really devastating condition. In Parkinson, the way that it's used is they can tell you if you have this abnormal protein configuration that could be a marker that you have Parkinson disease. And so it's 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 kind of a cool and and uh, a nice way that we see you know technology from one thing and methods and science translated to another. Very, very cool. So it's also called a, it's like a seeding assay, right? So why why is it called that? I think the easiest way to think about this is let's say you plant a seed, you know, in the ground and you're trying to make the plant grow. Okay. So now imagine you have this spinal fluid, okay, of, of these folks that may or may not have Parkinson disease and it may or may not have this abnormal protein, but let's say it does have the abnormal protein. That's the seed, right? And you can put that in and you can combine it with some normal protein and quake 
link the two together and see if you can make something grow. So what's going to happen is you're going to get the growth when the when the abnormal protein turns the normal bad, okay? When it turns that normal bad, you quake it for 20 or 30 hours or however long your assay runs, you're going to be able to, to see that they have that bad Parkinson protein. Your uh, sort of criticism of the, the way that the paper is done and also the technique is that it's really important of who's looking at this assay and doing the assay, right? It's very um, operator dependent, right? My criticism isn't necessarily of the paper of the authors. It's it's more of a caution than a, than a criticism, a cautionary tale. So if you look over the last 10 years of people that have used these types of assays where they quake, they shake and quake, you know, to get the answer, it really depends on how the assay is done, what the ingredients are, and the secret sauce of how it's done to see if you can get over 90% in terms of the sensitivity of that assay. And so, so it is really important how it's done. And I think one of the things that was nice about this study is they used cerebrospinal fluid, which is spinal fluid. That's the fluid that bathes the brain and the spinal cord, okay? So that's a really good source, you know, a rich source that may have that Parkinson's some protein in it. And they used an assay that was developed by Claudia Soto, who was one of the early pioneers of making these assays in prion diseases and quaking proteins for other reasons. And, uh, and so, so they used a really good assay. But if you look across you know, all the different papers, I just caution people to watch out because some of those assays are down to 50%. And uh, and so, so as we apply it, we've got to remember it matters how it's done. And hopefully these will get better and better. And guess what? We hope that they're going to go to scan and some other body fluids that are easier to get to than spinal fluid. Absolutely. I think that is one of the drawbacks, right? Of get, trying to give it lumbar puncture is not a joke on our patients, um, you know, but, but for the study, they were able to collect an amazingly rich data sort of set. And, and so I think let's get into the nitty gritty a little bit of that Lancet study. Yeah. So the findings of the study were that they were able to look at folks with and without genetic abnormalities for Parkinson. So these would be mutations that, that cause Parkinson. And they're able to look at people who are at risk, who might have something like uh, this uh, acting out of your dreams or smell or, or something they call it prodromal. Some people call it, use that term, meaning maybe these are symptoms that occur before they have Parkinson's and they might be at risk because they have a gene. And they're able to look at all of these different populations. And what they found was that when they did this assay, okay, when they quake this and shake up that, that, uh, that CSF, when they get their result out, they do the best when they combine it with someone who they think is going to get Parkinson or has Parkinson and also has smell abnormalities, which is very interesting. The smell actually drove up the, the sensitivity of this way into the high 90s. And so, so that it can matter when you pair it with the right things. And so, so I think using all the data was important. One of the things that was, was absolutely critical for people to remember is, is that the most common genetic abnormality of Parkinson is called the LRRK2 kinase. It's just a single mutation, okay, that's the most common mutation for Parkinson disease. And it turns out that these types of assays, even when done on this great enriched study, uh, turned out that it only hits, you know, maybe two thirds of the people correctly. And so that tells us something about Parkinson disease, something about these assays and where we have to be careful. So, so, so some folks that are carrying that mutation may come up negative. So there's a lot of learning that is, is still yet to be done. And by the way, this, the findings in this study have been shown by 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 uh, several previous studies. If you look back in the literature, and so this is the the great thing about this is it's enriched, it's in CSF, it's a large cohort, and it kind of brings together. I call it the drip 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 of evidence comes together on this paper and and shows us things that we knew, like we knew that these assays were having trouble with the LRRK2 mutation. Yeah. And you also mentioned that there was um, some issues with the gender um, differences as well with re respect to women. So can you, can you elaborate a little bit on that? I spoke with the, the, the studies senior author, Andy Sidoroff, who thought it was actually pretty interesting that there's differences in this assay for picking up the Parkinson, whether you're a man or whether you're a woman. And so, so that is something that, that is, is a novel finding to this study, but it's very preliminary. So I, I hesitate to, to go too far with 
with that until we see a little bit more data. But but you know, it's something we're going to have to pay attention to. I will remind people who you know who are interested in this topic that Parkinson is much more common in men than in women. But it's going to be important for us to develop an accurate test for women uh, who uh, we're trying to detect whether or not they may have Parkinson or are going to get Parkinson. Yeah, and absolutely important that women get involved in research in general, because I think we we have not seen a lot of women be studied and we haven't really catered, um, you know, a lot of treatments to women. This is all really interesting and all, but what does it mean for our general neurologists out there, even our primary care docs, uh, this type of information? Yeah, that's so important. I'm so glad you asked that because at the end of the day, what is the take home message? Everybody sees this, you know, it's up in lights, so we better do something, right? It's up in lights. Well, I would say not so fast, not necessarily. Okay, if you already have Parkinson, the cat is out of the bag, as they say in the old cliche, and you're not going to get anything more from, from knowing whether or not you have a synuclein from this assay. If you don't have Parkinson, it could be a diagnostic test, but it isn't quite ready for prime time yet. And so I think we should be careful about using it yet until we've kind of really brought it forward and we know all the data and we want to make sure we don't miss some of the mutations and we understand what it means. Now, if you have dopamine responsive, meaning you're taking dopamine medicine for your Parkinson, it's doing well, and there's it's very clear, and you're not there's no concern with your doctor. They know you have Parkinson. The only benefit you get from this is knowing potentially if you have a positivity on this assay that might uh, allow you to qualify for a clinical trial or might allow you to get a different treatment in the future, but nothing right now. Now, I do think that those of you that are enrolling in studies totally encourage that. We want to, you know, try these assays on as, as many people as we can, a number of different techniques and help to make this better. And the better means we're going to be able to create classification systems, particularly for regulatory agencies like the FDA, who are going to require that we better classify and also stage disease uh, in order to develop new therapeutics and to drive kind of the next generation of therapies for Parkinson. And so I think it's going to be important as you as you move forward. So outside of this biomarker, um, Mike, is there other things that you're excited about on the horizon? I know we were just at the AN, both of us, and there was some um, reports of uh, sort of peripheral biopsies of different areas of the body and other uh, sort of biomarkers. What's your take on that? So we're in a new era of, quote, biomarkers. You know, how can we measure diseases in a more exact way than some of the scales? And then we have to think about diagnosis. It's a difference between diagnosis and then monitoring the disease over time. Because once the cat's out of the bag, you know what you have. It's more important to monitor it and to have good really accurate. You know, like if you're doing diabetes, you see that that sugar level goes up and down. It's very accurate. We are not that accurate yet in Parkinson. And I think folks need to understand that the skin biopsies are going to be really interesting because you can take the skin and do many of these assays on the skin. If the skin can be shown to be as good as the spinal fluid, that's going to be a much easier test for folks. There was also some data presented here um, recently on people doing submandibular gland biopsies and also getting body fluid, you know, from from other areas and sweat and other things. And so, so I think thinking through what what might be the path forward is going to be exciting. And so monitoring diseases and then also using that information to be able to measure and reduce the number of folks that we're going to need in clinical trials to drive a new treatment for Parkinson disease. So once you can biologically diagnose and monitor, and the second part is really important, monitor, you can reduce from the number that you need to test these new drugs and therapies from potentially thousands to hundreds. And that's a huge difference. Very, very exciting. Well, thank you so much for summarizing this so beautifully. I think you really brought it home about you know, we're not there, you know, on a clinical level using this type of assay in clinic to diagnose people quite yet. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks, Mike, for joining us today. And uh, we're excited about this new biomarker era. Pleasure. Thank you for having me.